Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our October 17th business meeting. Would you please stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we do have a change to our agenda tonight. We would like to move uh, Roman numeral three, the celebration of excellence, to uh, actually underneath number four, and we'll move number four up to number three. So with that change, are there any other changes that we need to make? All right, the change is being made because Adele's been invited to the town meeting today. If you remember, at our last meeting, we did the, um, I guess we'll call it the celebration for the and they're doing it at the town, and we'd like to have Adele there as we had the town supervisor at ours. All right, may we have a motion then to accept the agenda with the change? So moved. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Okay, we'll keep the agenda as is. All right, we give the opportunity for visitors to speak to the board. We limit it to 15 minutes total or five minutes per individual. Is there anyone in the audience tonight that would like to address the board? Come on up, Amy. You, you can use the, the mic next to Lindsay. Just a second. Amy, do you need her, the name and address? Do you have it from last time? Yeah, and I didn't say it. It's Amy Sokash, 661 Lake Road in Webster. Um, okay. So, First, um, thank you for your service and dedication to students. As always, I am grateful. Um, these are turbulent times and times of great change. Um, and I am genuinely grateful for your commitment because you guys log a lot of hours and you're volunteering all of it. Um, and I'd like to thank you too for um, sponsoring the Common Core workshop last Friday, or last Thursday rather. Uh, it seemed well attended and productive and I'm looking forward to the feedback from all the questions from the audience. Um, so that same night, and I'm sure that we all know, uh, there was the first of the five uh, town hall meetings in Poughkeepsie. Um, and I watched the meeting in its entirety, and I thought about it, and I wanted to just share some thoughts and ask you to consider a couple things. And um, first, the, the statements made by uh, Regent Lester Young. He had said, I am acutely aware that good ideas live and die based on execution. And to me, this was the most poignant comment of the evening. Um, he went on to say that the regents um, and himself, that, that we want to hear from people on the ground how the reform is being executed. Uh, his wish would be shortchanged by Commissioner King, who got his time to talk well over an hour but did not allow parents and teachers, which he later accused of being special interest, um, their allotted time for public comment. And while I do not condone the behavior of the crowd, um, I also do not condone the behavior of the commissioner. So I'm hoping that Webster as a community um, can learn from this and find some middle ground for some meaningful, rational discourse. The discussion of education reform cannot be limited to just presentation of the intended benefits of the standards. We also have to address all of the other things that are packaged with it, including APPR, the high stakes testing, Pearson, InBloom, um, even the implementation of the modules, um, especially at the elementary level. Uh, I'm not in the camp that wants to dump the core, but many are gonna end up here uh, if, the, if the issues related to the execution and the implementation are not addressed or if they're dismissed as special interest. Um, so we need to know and trust that you are aware of, that you acknowledge, and that you're acting on the concerns and the frustrations of the students, the parents, the teachers, and the administrators. And this comes from conversation, not presentation. I'm asking our community to trust one another and come together as a group to have a conversation. I can speak from experience because I am very fortunate and very thankful 
to have had many a conversation with Mr. Neenan and Mr. Blask. Um, and the conversations to me were incredibly productive and I was left feeling both heard and also much more informed. And I lost my place. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> um, so yeah, support from the stakeholders, I think it cannot be coerced or demanded. I think that it has to be earnest and, and authentic. And I think that that will come from transparency, but also from good listening on both sides. Um, and I, I think it will go a long way. So um, lastly, I think if we all just walk the talk of our core beliefs, the students first, the collaboration, accountability, and communication, we will find that we have much more in common um, than we are apart. And, uh, and no one wants this district to succeed more than the parents, no one. So please, um, please trust us because we trust you with our kids every day. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Is there anyone else from the audience that would like to address the board tonight? Okay, we'll move on to our student liaisons. Mary or Lindsay, who would like to go first? Okay. Hello, and thank you for allowing me to share the exciting things that are happening at Thomas. It's hard to believe that there are only two weeks left in the first marking period. This week is our homecoming week. Starting off the exciting week, we show our Titan pride by wearing Titan gear. On Wednesday, it was Arch Nemesis Day. With the freshmen dressing up as either cops or robbers, sophomores were zombies or apocalypse survivors, juniors had superhero versus villains, and seniors were angels versus demons. Our hallways have never looked stranger. <laughs> Today was class theme day. The freshmen were Hawaiian paradise. The sophomores brought us out west. The juniors were army strong, and the seniors rocked the 60s. Tomorrow is class color day. Freshmen in pink, sophomores in blue, juniors in purple, and seniors in black. Everyone is also very excited about the pep rally. It should be very fun. This Saturday, on October 19th, the homecoming parade starts at 12 noon, and the homecoming football game starts at 7 p.m. This is where the beloved spirit stick will be handed out. The Counseling Center has been also very busy hosting college reps coming in to meet with students. There have been 49 colleges who have already visited Thomas, and there are 38 more coming in the next month. 140 juniors will spend the next Tuesday visiting six college, area colleges to get the up-close and personal look at our great local schools. Our seniors have been very busy with preparing for college applications, and 50 of them have already completed the process and are waiting to hear the exciting news. This Saturday, 475 Schrader and Thomas students will be spending their morning at Thomas taking the PSAT exam, which may end up offering some national merit scholarships to those taking it. In the world of sports, both boys and girls cross country teams have been named Monroe County champs. The girls were 22 and 0, and the boys were 21 and 1. They are off to the county to meet, off to the county meet next weekend. The varsity girls soccer team just found out they clinched the Monroe County title and will finish up regular season playing against Schrader tomorrow, then off to sectionals next week. Our girls tennis team has also had a very successful season with 12 and 6 record. Our football program participated in the annual buddy walk for Down syndrome on su Sunday, October 6, which was held at Thomas. Many donations were collected to support Brandon Angie and this wonderful organization. Congratulations to the Webster Marching Band who placed first in Victor and has moved up to second place standings in New York. If you have not been able to see this great band, this Saturday evening is the annual autumn fanfare held at Schrader at 530. Many of our students and families are excited about all the great things happening at Thomas, which can be found on social media. Our Thomas blog shows pictures of students and school events. We can follow the happenings through Twitter as well. It has been a great month at Webster Thomas. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you, Mary. Yeah. Lindsay? Good evening, board members. I'm Lindsay Fayette. The past few weeks have been very exciting at Schrader. Um, earlier this week, Ms. Ham's class, um, wrote, they recorded the State Education's Common Core videos on Engage New York. And last week, we had a football game against Thomas and we won there. Um, and the fans did a whiteout 
for us and the participation from them was fantastic. This week we are winding up in anticipation of our homecoming, which is tomorrow. We had a massive amount of participation in Spirit Week this week in comparison to the last year. Um, coming up, we have the tennis sectionals where we have Shilin Zhao, our number one seed, Megan Gamble, our number three seed and defending champion, and four others competing. And our girls varsity volleyball is tied for first place in their division and ranked fourth in the state. Thank you. That is all. Uh, just one quick question that I know the students can't answer, but maybe our principals can. I heard 475 for our PSAT test. That's a, is that, that's a pretty good number, isn't it? That's great to hear. Yeah. Thank, thank you. All right, our other liaisons. Um, okay, we'll do WTA first. Okay. Do I see the parents? No, I don't see a parent. Hello, Lisa. Good morning, or good uh, morning. Yeah. Good I evening, tell you're a teacher. <laughs> I know. Um, it has been a spirited week at both high schools. Uh, not only have students been respectful and dressed appropriately, but faculty have been actively involved in spirit wear as well, as you can see. Um, and we're all very excited about both homecoming games that will be taking place Friday night for, um, see, my daughter's going to both, so I'm going to get them mixed up. Tom, uh, Schrader's tomorrow night and Thomas's Saturday. So uh, we're all looking forward to that. Teachers will be at both. And um, we also are looking forward to the parade. I have given every board member a flyer, and we will be inviting you again to come to the benefits fair that will be November 17th it's a, or 14th. It's a Thursday from 3 to 6. Uh, every year when we plan the benefits fair, Ida Mara in particular, she's always very attentive to what the needs are of the of the teachers and we have information and we have booths that meet the needs of teachers and we always enjoy the board coming and in, and partaking in our hors d'oeuvres so feel free I hope you're able to put it on your calendar and that's it for me tonight do you have any questions no. okay. thank you Lisa thank you. I don't believe I see PTSA here tonight no well, in that case, we'll move on. Um, we're about to take a look at the action steps the secondary buildings are taking to respond to the uh, achieving the district goals of academics, culture, and fiscal responsibility. So we invite our secondary principals to come up and tell us about that. Good evening, everyone. Hello. Can you hear me all right? Yep. Great, thanks. Uh, good evening, everyone, and it's, uh, it's certainly a pleasure, our pleasure tonight to be presenting our Board of Education, our building goals for our secondary schools to the Board of Education. And with us tonight, we have uh, Shelly Cahoon right here next to me on my right, uh, our Assistant Superintendent for Pupil Services. We also have Dave Swenson, our middle school principal here at Spry Middle School, Jim Ginling, our middle school principal at Willink Middle School, uh, Joe Pastoka, our senior high school principal at Schrader High School, and also Glenn Weedor, our senior high school principal at Thomas High School. Tonight, we're going to present our goals in three steps. First of all, step one, we'll take a look at our goals from last year and reflect upon the many accomplishments that we saw in our classrooms and in our schools. Step two, we'll take a look at this year's goals and we will share action steps that we have taken thus far and will continue to take to accomplish our goals. In step three, we'll have a chance and an opportunity for you to ask questions of us that we uh, will be open to answering for you. The process that we follow, there we go. <laughs> 
The process that we follow each year is to take our direction and guidance from our Board of Education goals and to utilize them to form our building goals. Once they are created, they serve as a guide for our PLCs to create their goals. Our core beliefs continue to anchor our work and serve as a source of strength when collaboratively determining our goals. They truly do guide our schools and they have become part of our fiber. Last year, this group, along with Adele and with CARM, we worked closely to determine our focus areas for our staffs for this year. It was through this work that we were able to create a focus for each of the three reg Regents Reform Agenda items and also to have a focus uh, in regards to our work with PBIS, our Positive Behavioral Intervention Services. Those have become our focus areas for this school year. And this has led us to our common learning plan. And to tell us more a little bit about our learning plan, I'm going to turn things over now to Shelley. Thanks, Brian. As, as Brian shared with you, the common learning plan was developed as a guide to support the professional learning needs for all staff, um, which would include uh, teachers and administrators alike. The focus areas are data-driven instruction, common core curriculum, our APPR, which is the annual professional performance review, and our PBIS, positive behavioral intervention supports. To allow for uh, collaborative leading and collaborative learning, we've identified teachers and administers, administrators to create the learning plan and provide the lesson during the faculty meetings. Having the common faculty professional development and common learning has allowed us to focus our efforts together and to collaborate across all buildings. You'll see now this is our secondary learning plan and it identifies the uh, focus areas for learning at each of our faculty meetings. Um, you'll see that it's, it began in, Ju in July and it continues through June. Um, in some of the months, it includes the um, scheduled learning meetings that may take place prior to the faculty meetings. We are, are very um, glad that we're be able, we use this document as a fluid document and we re review it and revise it um, as needed at our secondary department meetings. So just to summarize, when you look at this plan, um, the guiding principles that, that lead this plan are the consistency in learning for all staff, Focus learning, working stronger and smarter together. Increased teacher voice in faculty and curriculum meetings and modeling the common core instruction. At the middle school for the 12-13 uh, school year, uh, we looked at, uh, in terms of reflecting, we looked at three different areas that we wanted to, to talk about tonight and uh, we'll go into depth in each of those in just a moment. Uh, first is the integration of the common core shifts. Uh, the significant growth that we saw uh, in our READ 180 and System 44 program that I'll get into in a moment, and uh, our uh, continual growth and increase in enrollment and achievement in living environment and algebra at the middle level, and uh, Mr. Gindling is going to go through that with you in a moment as well. So when we look at the Common Core, as Brian was talking about the, the shifts that we wanted to take our staffs through relative to the Common Core, we really focused on uh, trying to see within the classroom and in the instruction the text complexity, uh, for students and for staff to uh, encourage kids to provide evidence in, through the text and refer back to their text in their responses, which created greater, greater depth of conversations, a lot of wonderful student dialogue. Um, and then in mathematics, going beyond simple mathematical computations and really getting to the why and, and how things work rather than simply just solving an equation or a problem. Um, and then in math also, uh, modeling and using manipulatives to uh, make the case for kids to understand that depth um, and using different uh, modalities to get them there. The next uh, graph that you're going to look at is our READ 180 results, and READ 180 is our targeted uh, intervention uh, that focuses on uh, reading comprehension with students. And you'll notice what we want to draw your attention to is the approximate year's growth, uh, and it breaks it down between uh, Spry and Willink. And typical growth, you can see there is 2.1 or 2.0, and, and so our, uh, we're averaging over two years' growth 
uh, in our student performance over the course of the year. Uh, in our conversations with Scholastic, typical growth, and this is our first year, 2012-13 was our first year of implementation, typical growth is, is uh, one year, and we have far exceeded that in our middle level, and we've continued that this year. Uh, so that's a wonderful, wonderful testament to the work of our staff and our students. Uh, the next graph uh, looks at System 44, which is, again, an, another uh, intervention support program that focuses on fluency and phonics remediation. And what you're looking at is a pre- and post-scholastic, uh, SPI is scholastic phonics inventory. And it's showing, if you look at the graph, you can see how we've moved students from that pre-decoder or that early reader and being able to um, uh, decipher words from a beginning level and moving them towards the advanced level. Uh, so we're seeing a very positive shift there in growth in our students throughout the year. And this is, this is based on an entire year at both schools. And the uh, last slide on System 44 that you're looking at is another inventory that the students took. And this is a scholastic uh, reading inventory, and again, a pre and post. And what you're looking at there is the growth that we see in our students from below basic and moving them from uh, that level into basic and into proficient. And obviously, the further we want to continue that work and that positive trend of growth uh, and moving them hopefully towards the advanced level. So again, this is, this is positive interventions that we've seen um, in our reading programs this year, uh, over the course of last year, excuse me, the 12-13. And now Mr. Ginley is going to talk us a little bit about uh, the algebra. One area we've been uh, working tirelessly on is to stretch students and staff in terms of a growth mindset. As you know, we've worked tirelessly to instill that in all of our students and staff. And um, one area that we've been focusing on is getting children to stretch themselves in terms of algebra and living environment. As you can see, uh, we've had significant enrollment increase in the last few years. 2010-11 uh, was 198, and uh, this past year it was 230, and we're up higher than that this year. Um, what's impressive and what's a testimony to the students and staff work in embracing that growth mindset is you can see their average uh, has slowly crept up. It's up to 89 now. And we have three quarters of our students achieving mastery on that exam. With living environment, we see the same trend. Um, again, students are challenging themselves. Staff is challenging themselves to get more and more children in those classes. And again, you can see the average right around 90. And the mastery rate is right around 80%. And we're, we're excited as this year we have even more and more children pushing themselves and the staff is eager for the challenge to maintain that trend. This also sets them up to be more successful in high school and have greater opportunities. And for those opportunities, I'm gonna pass over to Glenn Weedor. And as Joe or Jim and Dave just pointed out, they're really setting the table nicely for us at the high school. And last year we set a goal of 8% growth in our enrollment in AP. We exceeded that goal, we had 10% growth. Uh, I'm going to go through some, some graphs you may have seen, but I know the people at home have not seen it. Um, if you look at this graph, since 2000, from 2009 back, we had a flat growth, 25 to 28% of our kids um, were taking AP courses. One in four were, were chosen, and those were the kids that were in AP. If you click that again, you can see where we've come since uh, 2009, um, almost double, well, quite a, quite a bit of growth in our AP course, um, you click the next slide, and you can see what that equates to in the number of exams written. So since 2006, we've had 86% um, amount of growth over the eight years. What does that look like for kids? You know, when, when we first introduced the, the idea of the growth mindset to staff and talked about, you know, we're gonna embark on this journey of, of challenging kids and stretching them, we talked about an implementation dip where um, other districts that have done this have seen their scores go down slightly over the first two or three years of implementation. We have not really seen that, and if you look at this next chart, you'll see that you know, we have uh, an 89% uh, amount of growth over eight years in our scores as well. So students scoring three plus on those 1,760 exams in 2013, 1,355 of those exams were passing. So our kids are not only taking and challenging themselves, but they're also they're passing those exams, which is great. 
as Glenn had indicated, the advanced placement uh, program is an important part of our uh, vision and our uh, future for students. What I'd like to do is in the slide we show up here, we'd like to talk a little bit about where we ended up in the 2012-2013 school year. Uh, our district graduation rate had a level growth. Uh, this is, again, preliminary accountability data, which means it's live. There's consistent adjustments to it as students succeed. But we were between 93 and 94 percent at this particular time. We had an increase in aspirational rate of 9.5 percent. Uh, for those at home, when we talk about the aspirational rate, we're talking about English language arts having our student achieve at least a 75 percent or better. And when we talk about mathematics, generally the uh, guide exam is algebra, and uh, we hope for an 80 percent or better out of those students. So we've had a significant increase, and it's a focus within both buildings that if a student doesn't quite make that aspiration rate, we encourage the resources and we encourage the time to retake those exams and, and increase that level of success. Uh, that 9.5% increase, in, increase put us at about 61% district-wide. And then uh, an important factor also are the advanced designations diploma. And for those at home, uh, based against the standard regents diploma, it requires more math, more science, uh, language, et cetera. And we have 57% of our district students graduating with uh, advanced designation diplomas. So looking at where we were off the 2012-2013 school year, it helped us in developing what our goals would be as we embarked on the 2013-2014 school year. So Jim is going to talk a little bit about the middle school aspect first. Jim? Our middle school goal will be to increase the percentage of students meeting proficiency on the New York State ELA, 6-8, and mathematics exams by 5%. As we look at the high school, again, when we take a look at the uh, graduates from the cohort group, uh, we are looking for them to achieve Regents Diploma or greater. We are again encouraging that stretch, hoping that students take a look and say, well, this is what I perceive is what I can do. Well, how can I move you above that? The students engage in rigorous coursework that will help them in exiting our schools prepared for career, college, and community readiness. We use measures that have been recognized by the state and, of course, by our district, which include the aspirational graduation rate, the cohort graduation rate, also the number of students exceeding uh, graduation with advanced designation diplomas, the increases that we've reflected in advanced placement enrollment and our AP achievement by grade, and emphasis on the importance of a student really leaving and hopefully with a better understanding of what career, college, and community readiness really means as they move through our academic program. In the middle school, we've outlined some action, some action steps, and the first is the implementation of the Common Core modules in ELA and mathematics classrooms. And our second is the introduction of college and career readiness anchor standards in all content areas beyond math and ELA, and again, those are reading, writing, speaking, listening, and obviously they lend themselves to all content areas, and, it, and it's virtually impossible to either acquire and demonstrate knowledge without using one of those skills. So we need to make sure that they are embedded throughout and that children are well-developed in those areas. Dave's going to talk about our next action steps. We'll continue to use our common form of assessments, and as Jim talked about with the modules, uh, they lend themselves to that, and uh, continuing our work in the PLCs uh, to be the vehicle to help that um, continue. We'll use uh, Datacation, which is our data management tool that allows us to uh, get information in a timely fashion at the teacher level, along with uh, NWEA, Northwest Educational Association, our MAP assessment that we use uh, and have continued to use to monitor student uh, progress and growth. And then this year, uh, we are using ReadyStep, which is a pre-AP, pre-PSAT skills inventory uh, that gives us an idea of where students are uh, moving towards the high school and it's given to our eighth graders. Uh, we're in the process of doing that right now. Um, and that gives us some good information leading into our uh, course selection process that will begin uh, shortly in January. 
And then finally, uh, our Math 180, in addition to our Read 180 and our System 44 program, we're continuing that. Um, we've added Math 180, which is a similar uh, uh, product that will support uh, uh, academic interventions for our math students, and we're starting that at the sixth grade level. Okay. Some and of the high school action steps, uh, as I referred to in the previous slide, we will continue to sustain current focus on measures of student success, which include, as we've indicated, the AP enrollment, the achievement, aspiration rate, graduation rate, diplomas with designation, as well as students' achievement for mastery rate and passing rate in irregular subjects. We're also uh, taking a strong uh, look at additional opportunities for dual credits and employment certifications. We're going to look to explore this in order that all students can leave college, career, and community ready. One of the other action steps is we will provide timely support for all students to achieve their academic goals. The primary way is by using quality tier one instructional strategies. We as a group are looking at our common formative assessments to guide our instructions and make adjustments as needed and necessary. And also introducing the college career readiness standards to all content areas across our school beyond math and ELA. Just this week, uh, we had the pleasure of working with the CTE audit group that was here in town. And again, in line with uh, one of the board goals, we are looking to complete the career and technical education review process as part of the board's strategic planning initiative and to implement all the appropriate programmatic changes based on the recommendations they bring forward. And one other area that we feel there's an urgency for us to pay close attention to is to increase the computer science program across both buildings. Uh, if you, uh, I think, listen to Glenn and Adele, they had gone to the AP forum, and it was a strong signal that we need to make sure we're giving students the opportunity to advance themselves in computer-based programs, understanding language and its application. We have a good program, we want a better program, and we want to make sure that we're doing the best we can to offer that to our students. And for, for board goal two, I'm going to speak for both, for all four buildings. Um, I think you heard it in the liaison's words uh, about all the positive things going on in our buildings, especially this week during homecoming, but really any time during the year. Um, and we have really been focusing, as Shelley mentioned, with our learning plan, on focusing in different months on specifically on PBIS, Positive Behavior Intervention Systems. Um, specifically, um, at all levels, we have been increasing our communication and in increasing how we communicate with our families. Uh, we have weekly electronic newsletters that go out. Um, I know Mary mentioned the Thomas Liaison blogs and uh, Twitter, and we'll show you that in a minute, how we're using that at the high school. Uh, we started the year training all staff and informing them about the um, dignity for all students legislation and how that looked in, in each school and some of the requirements of that. And we're really just continuing to emphasize and model the PBIS care expectations in our daily interactions with kids across all settings. Um, as I mentioned before, if you go, this is actually the, the, the Schrader Twitter site. Um, so you can see they have 109 followers right now getting daily feeds from and, uh, and actually you can see we have our, we've been tweeted already, here we are sitting on stage, there's the back of my head, and uh, <laughs> so, and then Thomas has, has a similar site, so we're trying to keep parents and, and, you know, informed on what's going on, you know, information, you can't be quick enough these days, so we're trying to keep, this has a, a plus and a minus site, but we're, we're keeping our, our communities informed of what's going on too, so thank you everybody. Do you have any questions? Greatly appreciate it. Um, the numbers are amazing. I did, and 93% uh, to 94% graduation rate. Would that come out to be about like 650 students graduating? Is that what it is? Combined between the two schools? It's going to be a little higher. A little higher. A little higher. It's going to be closer to 575. I love the academic aspirational goals in the, in the college. It's definitely impressive. Um, and the numbers in AP are increasing is wonderful. 
how many, I just have a question, how many students would you say um, are in the vocational programs at BOCES? For the, the we have total district-wide, I think 148. 148, currently. okay. And then the other question, and what happens um, when a student doesn't graduate? So that what, what programs do we have in place to support that? Or what, I know there's a lot of family issues typically um, and come, in, come into play with those students transient population? I think we try to look at each student individually mm -hmm. and determine what the barrier may have been in having them be successful based on what the state would like to see, four years in completion. Okay. A number of the students need that additional semester or possibly a year to, to finish up and meet the standards that we're looking for. Uh, some students do choose another route where they may uh, go a GED or things like that, but mm -hmm. we have worked diligently to try and move students away from those paths because we really understand uh, the value of the high school diploma and hoping to get them and the families understand that same value. You know, you mentioned something about how many students are in, are in uh, vocational programs at our Foreman Center, and uh, it, a lot of the kids that come out of there are earning dual credits, as we mm -hmm. refer to. They're coming out with, with certificates of employment so that they are able to enter fields of, of work. But I think there's another step that we don't want to lose sight on. Taking a look at being college and career ready is a broad expanse of helping students to be prepared for the skill sets and thinking processes they're going to need to have. When we talk about career ready, it's not just what comes out of a typical, I'm going to say a foreman style program, mm -hmm. but rather through business courses, through technology education courses, through the computer based program courses that we're talking about, giving the students the ability to understand how those tools and those techniques and those processes become transferable into what happens in their future career paths. I know that most of us sitting here probably didn't have a real good idea in junior year or senior year of exactly what we were going to do but we knew that we were going to go down a path and every time we touch something we learned and we brought it with us as a building principal we sit here we don't know what they're going to do in 20 years because for many of them that job may just be starting or may not even exist yet but we do know that by broadening the scope they have to have the solid understandings in mathematics and language arts and science but broadening broadening the scopes of application broadening the scopes of understanding how it's relevant to the workplace and also, I would say making sure that they have a good understanding of what we used to call the scan skills, mm -hmm. but really become the skill sets that are essential in being successful in a workplace. When uh, Juanita Davies did that uh, research project for, for our district over here, there was a common theme of coming back of having students understand what good work qualities are, understand character education. There's so many components that come into this that I sometimes people look and say, well, which is the course they need? It's not a course, it's a learning cycle. And what our goal is, is that we can offer as many of these opportunities as we can for each one of our children, because their paths will differ. And we really don't know which one they're gonna end up on, but doing what we're doing and what this board is put into their goals and supporting, I really do believe is a positive way to keep things moving. Great to hear, Joe, appreciate it. Any questions, Tom? Uh, thank you for the report. Um, I think that last point, uh, especially in today's environment where there is transition happening in the way we're preparing the students for the future, um, I think the idea of the communication that you just showed with the Twitter is going to be important to figure out ways using our parent portal and everything we have available to keep the parents, um, as Amy mentioned in her discussion points, keep them informed. Uh, so that they can work with us because it takes a community to raise children. Thank you. Well done. Thanks. Janine? Comprehensive and so enlightening as always. Thank you. Uh, I just want to thank you for your response to the board goals. You know, met, met, met what we were looking for. And uh, Joe, also for your practical explanation there. It was very helpful. Thank you. I have a few. Um, I heard modeling Common Core instruction and implementing the Common Core modules. Could you explain how you're doing it? And second, what flexibility teachers have in those modules? Thank you. 
Um, as far as the, the module implementation, I think you're seeing um, in ELA and math, you're seeing a variety of um, uh, uses. At, at ELA, for example, you're using Odell units, which is a, an offshoot. It's, not a, uh, it's a portion of a, um, a company that developed part of the module. And some classes are using the full modules as a pilot. Um, but they, are, they understand enough that it is, there is some flexibility, Mike, within the modules uh, that they want to follow. And it's, it's, it's tightened down the curriculum for many of our staff. Um, and it's given us a little bit of a framework. And they're uh, piloting some of those things. We just had an ELA department meeting yesterday where we uh, went through how, uh, how st uh, staff are progressing and what our students are doing relative to the modules. And I would say the same in math. Uh, it's certainly requiring uh, additional preparation for our staff to, to be ready for that because it is different. Um, and it's, it's challenging them, but it's also challenging for our kids. For maybe, I know you're reporting to the board, but maybe yeah. for our, our people at home mm -hmm. that are listening, how is it different? I mean, the other day at our Common Core workshop, yeah. I tried to tell everyone that math is still math. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. So when right. people hear it's different, sure. I think they're starting to panic. Sure. Sure. So I don't know if you could address that issue. In terms of how is it different than it's you No, know, I'm not sure it is different, but you're telling yeah. us it is different, so explain the, that. The the difference really is in terms of the depth of conversations that students are having and it's it's really um, some of it is teachers taking a step back and allowing students to struggle with and, and, and go through discourse and have conversations, whether it's mathematics or in ELA having a, a discussion about a particular topic um, and using text-based evidence to support their claims or their responses. So um, that's what's different, if you will. It's still ELA, it's still reading, it's still writing, it's still mathematic computation, but the application and the context sometimes in which we're asking students to apply those things is what's different. Um, and it's at, a, it's at a deeper level Rather than just asking a student to simply compute something and or solve an equation, it's deeper than that and asking them to explain how did that happen, why is that, and, and to try to get deeper to get the kids to think about, okay, that's great in this situation. How are you going to apply it then to if you were, you were working on a job site and you had to uh, determine and solve this problem? Um, the pitch of the roof has to be this way and you have to work around the building codes um, rather than simply just... Um, figure this piece out. You know, Mike, if I could add just one piece to that. We sat, in fact, you and I were over there and you were saying, did you get the answer to that one? And it was interesting. It different ways. Yeah, well, you know, yeah. Yes. the two old guys mm -hmm. were working on it. I think the funny part was is that as I sat there and I watched people, first of all, they modeled the equation, X's and Y's and solving the equation and balancing the equation, the traditional way that we learned. But they also brought out the factor of visualizing the mathematics. And taking a look, and if you remember the one where 600 was 20% of whatever unknown it was, and you told me how you figured it out, and I sat there and I said, well, if 600's 20%, then 10% of it's 300, and 10% times 10 is a full, is 3,000. I worked it in another direction. They're encouraging students through this kind of mathematics to be able to take what might be the standard equation, learn it, visualize it in a different way, and transfer the learning because that's the most important key. Being able to transfer that learning from this application here to another place and another time. And I used to be mesmerized when my, my father-in-law was alive. He would sit there with a series of numbers and do addition like that. And I'd sit there and I'd look at him and figure, how the heck did he do it? Grouping of tens. That was the way he did it. Now, you could have probably be given him something else, and there wasn't a comfort level there, but that's what this man did, and he had it mastered. And I'd sit there in wonderment. That's what this math does. How can I group it? How can I visualize it? How can I capsulize it so that I can do this over and over again, and it changes that learning process? Adele, I think you wanted to say. No, I just wanted to um, highlight that we've watched math just in the last two days in both middle school and high school. And in both instances, there was a component a component of the lesson that was the direct teach, traditional teach, uh, teacher standing in front of the class, giving, you know, going through the examples. Um, but what was different was then students were working and allowed, they, they needed to work through examples, they needed to find different ways to solve the problem, get to that solution on their own. And in both of the lessons, both at middle school and high school, the teacher then, in the final challenge was now create your own 
from this formula that you've learned, create your own question mm -hmm. that others have to solve. So the element of thinking is so much deeper when you actually have to create your own question and apply that mathematical formula that before you just had to memorize and execute. So it's, it's so much different in the way that we're challenging students to think. Um, and what we know is that's directly correlated to things that they will need to be expected of them as they get out into the career market um, and that is now internationally competitive and they're going to need to be able to work in teams and solve problems and create solutions to problems we don't know exist. So um, that's how these standards are different because they are, they are challenging students to use those, those critical thinking skills in a deeper and richer and more consistent way than other standards have. Second question, I'm going to turn my attention to the, our district's um, second goal. We have a subset there that is talking about creating multiple opportunities for more student leadership. Now, you hinted at it in your report, but I'm wondering if you could be a little bit more specific if we're doing any action steps for that. Um, one very specific thing we have, at, have done at the high school is we have a leadership course. We have um, traditionally had a course called the UN Society, and that has focused on different things over the years. It, spoke, it focused on um, sports and society, the Holocaust, uh, different topics. And now the, now the topic at both schools is leadership. So we've ident students registered, um, some in Link Crew, some not, but they're, they're interested in learning about leadership opportunities. And uh, you know, part of one of the end products of the um, course is going to be to lead something within the school. So we're, we're trying not to just um, think of leadership as something that some kids have and some kids don't, but it's something that can be fostered if we give them examples and show them how to do it and talk about it. If I can add on. You wanted to come? Or? Oh, I was just going to say, is that a course they take during the day or is it a Yes, okay. yes, yeah. It's a social studies elective. Okay. Yeah. The middle school, we don't have a leadership course per se, but what we've been doing with our web leaders is not making web a, a three-day event where they come in, get trained, lead the sixth graders, and they're done. Uh, what we've been doing is really working every month to make sure those web leaders are involved in character trait development, finding their students that they've been leading throughout the year, working with them, touching base with them, and giving them multiple opportunities to continue to help those sixth graders grow. And what we're finding is that the, uh, the eighth grade web leaders are loving, the, they're loving that role. They love being leaders. They, they not only lead their web children, they lead others. And, and they just constantly are on the lookout for sixth and seventh graders and, and eighth graders, but primarily sixth and seventh who, who need a little help, need a little pick-me-up, and it's great to watch our web leaders grow in that area. I would add we also had at Open House, we had our web leaders uh, directing parents around the building, uh, uh, being over the PA system. And uh, last Thursday when we did have the Common Core workshop here, we had uh, 240 uh, sixth graders and about 60 eighth graders uh, in a web event uh, that was completely run by our students. Uh, so there are opportunities. It looks a little different at the middle level, but certainly uh, leadership opportunities are growing. Very good. Last question. I heard you mention more teacher voice. Could you be a little bit more specific on how we're giving teachers more voice? And another slash to that is, the board keeps hearing that teachers don't have a voice in the modules. So it's a question A and a question B. Well, I, I guess uh, I think we've been in <laughs> consistent communication with our staff about um, not just the modules, but certainly in listening to uh, what their struggles are or what their needs might be uh, as we implement different things and as we grow together um, and, and move through this. Um, one of the things that I think is vitally clear that we want to have, to your earlier point, Mike, was around the flexibility that we want to have, and we've, uh, part of that is being really explicit with them around what they can do and what they can't do in terms of um, there's, there's sometimes when you, when you start something new, people hear some things and you want to clarify and make it really clear that uh, the modules, we want them to follow the modules, but we don't want them to follow it, um, the script as it's written as law, that they have flexibility within that to make it their own. Um, and I think that's part of the challenge of when you do something for the first time and you're learning, as you well know, you know you're going through that and you feel like a first year teacher because it's the first time you've had it. So that's some of maybe what you're hearing um, of going through that and then at, 
As I get to know it, I have to make it my own and I have to wrestle with that and try different things. But we certainly want our staffs uh, not to be robotic and, and follow that script so intently that they lose the art and science of teaching um, and they <laughs> remember those things, right? And we want to make sure that they know that we support them uh, in the work that they're doing as they, as they go through this. That and I might think say something on my grave, I think. <laughs> <laughs> our, our but supporting the learning plan, the learning plan is really the, um, the, the goal and the focus of that is to have more, more teacher voice. And it is learning um, together with the administrators and lead teachers um, and teacher leaders um, within the buildings so that they develop the learning lesson, the learning plan, they learn that together, and then at the faculty meetings, then they present that learning plan to their colleagues. And they're able to use that art and make it their own, and that was a great example. I know each of them all worked on uh, one of the focus areas of, uh, of the 3D this past, uh, this past superintendent's conference day when they worked on the APPR component, and we happened to stop over at Schrader right at the end of that, and they had one of their, our, your art lead teacher, I think Joe was the one who really had taken a leadership role and had made this puzzle on the wall of all the learning that had happened that day with the Schrader staff. And it was really neat to see how there was a little tweak to it that they had taken, but it came from the teachers. That was, uh, that was the power of that. And, and I think it's important because it is a good question. Sometimes these presentations that we planned for, there is a need to have a common understanding of what the lesson is. It's important to make sure we're learning it in a way that we have a common understanding. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it becomes a rubber stamp process. When uh, Casey and, and Carolyn Carlton, the art teacher, and Amanda Tierson, our music teacher, and Shaban Julian, our, our chemistry teacher, took this, the content and the essential learning outcomes were still there. But they adjusted activities, teachers were taking their own input based on what they do and their knowledge. They put together what was a component part of a jigsaw and then met back with their department, which brought them back into a situation of here's what I learned over there and I'm going to bring it back here. And then upon their final discussion, they created the matrix that we ended up putting and posting on the wall. So I think it's important to recognize there is an essential learning outcome that has to be taken care of. But after that learning outcome has been achieved, teachers do manipulate it, stretch it, and move it so that it fits the learning style as well as the needs of their particular course. We see that a lot in the middle school, the PLC process. Um, without that PLC process, our teachers would not have the tool they need to share their own adjustments and tweaks to the Common Core modules. You know, we're watching them differentiate, we're watching them modify, and we're watching them assay that. One teacher will try it one way, one teacher will try it another, and then they'll get back together. And you know, to go back to the lead teacher point, what's been really, I guess, neat to watch is the way the lead teachers have really evolved into that conduit, because they're not only on the planning team and, and taking part in the teaching part in faculty meetings, but then to watch them have the ability to reach out to the individual PLCs, get information and feedback, answer questions, but then also bring that feedback back to our lead Bless. teacher council has been really powerful and it's really helped us make sure we have a pulse on what teachers need to be successful and therefore what students need to be successful. Thank you very much for your answers. Board, this uh, requires action, so may we entertain a motion to accept the secondary report. Okay, and second. All in favor? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nice report. All right, Adele, we'll move into your superintendent's report, or we can go up to your... Uh, let's do school board recognition. Okay. So um, Carmen and Shelley and Brian are going to help me with this because we thought it would be fun to do it a little differently tonight. <laughs> so I'll wait for my friends to gather. We are celebrating school board recognition and we are showing on the screen a proclamation that comes from um, our governor and our school, our school board members 
for this week. Now, it's actually the week of the 28th, uh, but because we don't have a meeting that week, we're celebrating this evening. And one thing we wanted to highlight this year a little differently than before is we wanted to weave in our school board recognition week with the theme of our district. And as we know that Webster cares, and that's really the focus of our second goal, we want to weave in tonight the notion that our Webster school board cares. So as we talk about this, we have four letters, the acronym of CARE, standing for Cooperation, Accountability, Respect, and Excellence. So we are going to highlight as a senior team the attributes of the board in each one of these areas. All right, and I have the first, cooperation. Our Board of Education demonstrates cooperation by supporting student learning, supporting our staff members, and supporting our community at large. You are leaders that have the best interest of stakeholders in mind and you encourage continuous growth in all of us. You ask constructive questions and always follow with, quote, how can we support all of you to do your work? Accountability. As a member to the Board of Education, you are accountable and responsible to the district and to the community as a whole. We appreciate your dedication, your commitment, and your, the time you devote in service of your community. I can speak personally to the commitment that you have to make as the wife of a school board member in another district. The, the time commitment is significant, and your service to the community is, is greatly appreciated. Thank you. So I have respect, and first of all, I'd like to respectfully wish Mr. Benz a happy birthday. Tonight's his birthday. Um, <laughs> So thanks for giving up your evening. I'm sure you, there's, nothing, there's nowhere else you'd rather be. Um, and uh, so when we think of respect, uh, personally, when I, uh, how you guys exemplify respect, um, you just look back about 30 or 40 minutes ago um, when uh, Ms. Sokash was, was up here and um, res you know, she was very respectful and, and gave uh, some of her thoughts, and which are probably um, those of many other parents and perhaps faculty members and students. And um, it is so important that they know that they have a board that will respect them and that will respect uh, when they come and they bring their concerns to you. And I know that the, I'm sure the teachers and the administrators feel the same way. So that sense of respect that you offer um, all, of, um, all of our community members is certainly appreciated. And I have excellence, and I want to begin my remarks by saying that you model that excellence in board operations and the functions of the board. Um, as we look around the table, there are countless years of service represented here. We have members of this board that show leadership on an, in, at Monroe County level, show leadership at the state level, and you model that excellence and expertise as a board of education. And the other thing I want to highlight with excellence is we strive for a growth mindset. And I have appreciated watching that come from the board, that strategic modeling of what growth means. Because you do stretch yourself, and you do work through issues. And um, that is so very much appreciated by myself as your superintendent, by the senior team, by the staff, by the administration, that we are in this work together, and that makes an excellent school board. It also supports an excellent district, which is what we want, excellent opportunities for our students and families. So we, we have a token of appreciation for you this evening, um, and we just want to highlight that we think that the Webster School Board cares, so um, we're going to hand out some bags, and if you want to, there's a note from me in each one, and then uh, if you just want to take out your gift, you'll see what I mean. <laughs> 29, Paul? <laughs> Which anniversary? Okay. One, two, three. Model adult behavior by reading the cards. Oh, you could. Yeah. <laughs> It's empty, but it is. A token of appreciation for the long hours you put in, something to help you along the way. And uh, we did take special pains to get the Webster School Prouds etched into that for you. So. Thank you.
you never have enough of this. Uh, I'm, I'm using that at the uh, NISBA conference. No. I'm using <laughs> it to get, take it to Autumn Fanfare to keep you warm, oh. right? <laughs> <laughs> you got to figure it out? There it goes. Okay, cool. All right, Adele, would you like to do Thank your you. superintendent's report? I certainly would. So since we just recognized our school board, I want to personally congratulate Tom Nisbeka on the leadership that he is showing as his role in president of New York State School Boards, NISBA. The organization is once again having its annual conference next weekend, and Tom will be presiding over that conference as president um, and then passing on the torch. So I know a contingent of Webster District folks will be there to cheer you on, and we just wanted to give you a shout tonight and thank you for your leadership at the statewide level. Thank you. Now, Webster's homecoming celebration is coming up this weekend, so I want to personally invite everyone to join the festivities. We've put them up on the screen for you. Come out, um, come participate in what is quickly becoming a fall tradition and a wonderful way to show our Webster schools pride. Friday, October 18th, the Webster Schrader Stadium is Webster Schrader versus Fairport homecoming football game. The Webster Marching Band will perform at that game. Saturday, October 19th at noon, and, and take that time into account noon. We've always, it's always been a little earlier, but we're doing it right, right at noon this year. The homecoming parade starts at Spry, heads down South Ave to Ridge Road and ends at Fireman's Field. Then we have two events, Saturday, October 19th, 7 p.m., Webster Thomas Stadium. Webster Thomas versus Wilson, homecoming football game. And Saturday, October 19th at 5.15 p.m. at the Webster Schrader Stadium, the 28th Annual Autumn Fanfare. Performance of, this, of the area's 14 best marching bands, including the Pride of Webster. So we're all going to be enjoying these events. We have several honored guests joining us for different events. We'll be announcing them um, at each event. There'll be some dignitaries marching with the school board um, and senior staff in the parade. So we're very excited about this. We like we just made an outreach and wanted to make it just a, a whole community-wide event, and we hope to see you at at least one of these special events this weekend. Another great event happened district-wide last Thursday. It involved nearly 700 fifth graders who headed out to Webster Park for a morning of orienteering. This annual event is organized by Webster's elementary phys ed teachers and lets the kids test their map reading skills. So they have to navigate through several courses and um, exposes the kids to the natural community resource we have in Webster Park and hopefully encourage them to go back and visit with their own families and take a map with them and show off their newly acquired map reading skills. Very fun event. And lastly, I want to mention a collaborative campaign that we have partnered with other agencies to end distracted driving, and that is sponsored by the Ad Council of Rochester, and it's called Yeah, You're That Distracting. While there have been many worthwhile programs that focus on distracted driving, this particular campaign takes a new approach by focusing on a driver's family and friends. So we're showing you a poster that we have up in several strategic places in the school, and it has a website, and we encourage you to go to that website. The message is simple. If you're talking or texting with someone on the road, hold that conversation until a safer time. So you can visit the website, you are that distracting slash org to sign a pledge, so that you ask yourself, are you driving? You ask, is the person that I'm calling driving each time you call or text? And to find more about this community-wide campaign, please visit our website. We want our community and our students to stay healthy and happy because the Webster Board and the Webster community cares. And that ends my report. Thank you, Adele. We're now moving to board business, and we have two first readings on policies. Sue, you want to tell us a little bit about those? The first one is parent, student, and teacher organizations. We just wanted to be a little more clear. Um, previously, it read staff members and parents, and now we want to say parents, students, staff members, and members of the community are encouraged to join the PTSA or PSTA. I guess we have the order PSTA, but it's really PTSA. Anyway, we just want to make it clear that um, everyone is encouraged to participate. Does anybody have any questions? Is this on? It looks like, oh, now it's on. <laughs> Do you want me to say that over again? No, it's okay. okay. <laughs> it's not that interesting. So does anybody have any questions? No? Okay, so we'll bring it for the second read at the next board meeting. And the next one is screening of new school entrance. And we just wanted to, um, 
change what what it, what it previously read was which students may have disabilities, may be gifted, or may have may be of limited English proficiency. We wanted to say academic proficiency and need of customized services, just to be more accurate as to what we provide in Webster today. And it's just basically about screening of new entrants. And we're just hoping that makes it more clear. Is everyone good with that? Okay. All right. Then may we entertain a motion to accept the first reading of policy 2015 and 5030, please. So moved. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. All right. We'll move on to the NISBA school board resolutions. Uh, the resolution committee of NISBA has proposed some recommendations, which will be acted upon next week. And we need to provide our um, delegate, who's not here, so I will um, give him the notes. And there's a good chance I will be substituting for him. Um, so we'd like to review those recommendations at this time. Now, there's five resolutions in the consent agenda. They are a resolution regarding BOCES election. There is a second one that is calling for access of this F1 international students paying tuition attending public schools. I guess if you go to a private school, you can go for four years as an international student, but if you go as a public high school student, you can only go one year. And they're trying to equal, equal that off, so that's that particular resolution. The third one is prohibiting any new unfunded or underfunded mandates on local school districts. The fourth one is supporting efforts to ensure that there's fiscal oversight on charter schools. And the fifth one is supporting a code of conduct for school board association members. If I may, you those certainly. were five um, NISBA resolutions that were sunsetted, meaning they reached their five-year limit to be in our program and present to the legislature. We are asking consent way from the board to re-up those so that we can keep those in front of the legislators to say they're important, we need to act now. Just so you know, that's the consent right. portion. So can we agree that we will vote yes on those five resolutions? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll take a couple now together. Uh, another resolution that is being recommended for adoption is the elimination of the straw vote on district seeking mergers. A second one is additional state aid for increase in the school year or the school day. Another one is the repeal of the gap elimination adjustment. And then there's one about opposing granting tenure status to non-instructional employees. So we'll take a look at those four if there's any discussion or um, motions to not vote for those. Okay, so then we, we can say we'll agree with that. All right, we'll move on. There is a resolution uh, for establishing a TRS pension reserve fund. Another resolution is supporting aid adjustments due to a loss in the tax base of a district. And there is another resolution supporting additional aid for efforts made to enhance school safety. Can we agree on those resolutions? Yes. Okay, so we will again recommend that those are supported. We'll move on to a resolution supporting legislation to exempt school safety enhancing measures from the tax levy cap calculations. Paul, do you understand what that whole tax cap calculations? Yes. Okay because you're new to it. Yep. Uh, another one supporting legislation that creates a combined region's high school diploma with an associate's degree. And then there is one that supports legislation that requires all members of the TRS and the ERS to contribute um, to their respective retirement systems throughout their careers. I think there might be some discussion on some of these. <laughs> no. Wow. What's that last one a little bit? Um, let me see if I can call up the 12 actual. Years, 12 years ago. Is that a specific because, tier? Well, 12 years ago they eliminated or contribution after 10 years uh, in the system. Right. Um, and they stated it went to the it's a constitutional type thing. We're asking um, for that to be looked at again because it was added without a change to the Constitution. They just dumped it in. We're saying that we're at a 2% crossroads that the uh, school board association is looking for um, 
assistance again to say just contribute what you contributed before your 10 years uh, towards um, what is considered a fairly uh, uh, good uh, retirement system uh, to contribute again because as the community does if you stop contributing to yours it stops growing what they're just saying is go back to give what you gave before 10 years the same percentage amount And I don't know if you know the answer to this. Um, when did that happen? When did it make? It, it happened in the early 2000s when we had a boom in the. So it was because the because the, the, the investments was going so, so well so that they didn't need the contribution. 2001. Okay, so they stopped paying in 2001, and and that was because the right. stock market and the investments were doing so well. So well that they said so, we could stop this. Right, because then we, when it tanked, right. they didn't. Put it back in, and it was so they up. want to start it for the same reason or the opposite of the reason. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So that's what that meant. We'll see what happens there. So, our, what 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 would Webster vote on that? They're going to look on it. They're going to look at it. Right. It's, it's, it's right. just supporting legislation Correct. to right. look at yep. it. Yeah. Yeah. This is not this right. is not no, the legislation. Right. It's just saying. Yep. You know, legislature, would you look at this? I support that. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Uh, the last recommend, recommendation that is being recommended is supporting uh, P16 standards. So you're not just looking at, high, you know, from pre-kindergarten to high school, but also the post-high school education, the college level. Um, I. I'm, I'm a little leery about this because I'm not sure we have the business telling the colleges what they should do. Even though I kind of agree, but I, I'm, I'm a little worried on this one. It's, it's a good thing, but I don't think it's NISBA's job to tell the colleges what to do. Well, your commissioner and your regents are in charge through college. Yeah. We're saying that if you're worried about having people college and career ready, if you delay your entry into career post-college and you haven't gotten enough tread on your tires to be able to react in the business world, there needs to be some standards. That's all I'm saying. So we'll see what the discussion is. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little unsure on this one. Right. Are they, is this pertaining to public colleges or private? Stuff that we could, that the just system the, could be allowed, so it'd probably be Sunnis. So it'd be the Sunnis. Mm -hmm. Probably be the Sunnis, yeah. Sunnis and Coonies. So this is, we're kind of undivided, or not decided on this one, I think. I, I support this one. I, I too. Because they're just going to look at it for now. Yeah, we can. They'll talk we'll, about we'll, it. They'll talk this about it. This won't be right? as quick as last year's meeting. I can no. tell that already. <laughs> Sorry, Tom. Yep. All right, these, oh were, <laughs> these were not recommended for adoption. Uh, a resolution supporting the earlier practicum for college students preparing to become teachers. Uh, second one is support the truth and testing. Uh, I think the problem with this one, if you read it, was that it was too specific. It actually identified a bill by number, which kind of bothered me because the bill could change and everything would be uh, different and it's um, I think it's very difficult to support a resolution that could bring around new mandates but that's my opinion well these are groups now that are not recommended. right so I would right. I yeah. agree about not recommending this doesn't see the merit in these at least the resolutions committee does not and we agree we support yeah. Yeah. okay uh, there's one on supporting legislation that provides a limited number of grants to those schools seeking year-long school years. It's really redundant. But it's also limited number of grants. Yeah. So if you want to, you know, if you're not in that group and you don't get the grant, you're, you're stuck. Mm -hmm. And finally, there's one that requests a study of how technology, which would, they're actually talking about remote voting, could increase participation at the annual business meeting. The thing that I worry about here is if you're not present to hear the, the arguments, how do you know how to vote? Or, and that's why I would not support it. Because we're having this discussion here tonight. 
Right. But we're giving the flexibility to Fritz, Fritz the, that if he right. hears um, arguments contrary to what we recommended, then he can use his own judgment and Correct. vote that way. Okay. We okay. All, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. we're, we're all clear on that. Very good. Then we'll move on to our old business, which is the uh, the annual conference for the National School Boards Association. I did receive an email from Mike Gustin. He says he's interested. So if the board approves that, we can appoint Mike a delegate. And I'm also thinking that if, if we have enough money, can we send a second person in our budget? Or do we only want to send one? No, I think we have enough because the local, the local was because is here. So we don't have to pay for those expenses. Well, so. if there is enough, I would volunteer to go with Mike. I'll be there. Yeah, but you're being yeah. through the mm -hmm. um, through state. So that would okay. take. We'd have to nominate Mike and Mike to go to the national conference. Yeah. Now this could be something. <laughs> Mike and Mike. Yeah, so yeah, we, we have a talk show. Yeah. <laughs> nice. All right. All right. I'm, yeah, I'll I'm make good. that motion. Thank, Thank you. Yeah. And we fall, we just, we'll just say two, and then if we have to change off, it can be Right. Better. If, if yeah. there's not enough money, I will pull out, you know, if no, our budget is okay good. with it. I think mm -hmm. we should be fine. Mm -hmm. All right. So mm -hmm. Sue made the motion, and it was seconded by? Paul. Paul. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Okay, that takes care of that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Cindy, you did an excellent job of informing us who's coming to homecoming and who will be there, so I don't think we need to... Uh, take care of C because you've already done it for us. So thank you very thank much. You, we'll move on now to our board reports. Uh, Paul, do you have anything from any of your schools that you're I don't just remind, to? Just, no. just a reminder, uh, next Friday is the family dance at Clem South. Mm -hmm. And then the week after that is their next PTSA meeting, which is November 1st. Tom? November 1st PTSA. Uh, with the principal, it's a noon meeting. I plan to be there. Thank you. Janine? Um, Club North has their gala uh, Halloween parade coming up. Mm -hmm. That's that on the 31st. And PTSA meeting November 12th in the evening at 6.30. Thank you. Sue? So? I don't have a report tonight. Uh, Plank South PTSA had a morning meeting last week, and were those in attendance, we had the opportunity to meet new staff members, as well as their fifth grade student representatives. And if we enjoy our high school, it is a treat to hear your fifth grade students talk about what's going on in school. Uh, the PTSA then, they talked about the various volunteer opportunities that are available, and to help make the, their PTA more accessible, their next meeting is going to be more like a meet and greet than a regular business meeting. So they're encouraging anyone to um, check it out. And they have a very interesting uh, upcoming event which is called Trunk or Treat, where the parents come in with their cars and they take their trunks and they decorate them up and the kids go from trunk to trunk and gather treats, which sounds like a <laughs> nice idea. Uh, there also, last week was coffee with the Spry principal, and I have to thank Mr. Swinson for mentioning Khan Academy to the parents, yeah. dear to my heart. Uh, parents heard about what's being done in regard to keeping Spry a safe environment. There was a short discussion that did take place about the possible ramifications of Washington trip not happening, but the government came through for us, so that will take place. And they also talked about the pros and cons of the various formats for open house. And that's it for Spry. So let's move on. Well, Sue, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. But for our school liaison to the board members are making arrangements to work with Jim and the principals in the advance sense. of our building schools. Principals, you and I are going in the first to our schools. Oh, that's right. Um, yeah. Right, so each board member will accompany um, our coordinator of building and grounds and the principal on a walk through the buildings to inspect the facilities before we have our workshop together to talk about the short-term and long-term facilities plan for the yeah, district. Hopefully everybody has made arrangements for that? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Sue, would you like to tell us anything about steering? We haven't had a steering committee since committee meeting since our last meeting and our next meeting is October 30th. Thank you. Uh, Tom, Sue, do you want to do a legislative? 
again, we haven't had a meeting since our last one, um, and our next meeting is November 6th. And we are those interested. I think we have a is it a December 9th? December 9th is the um, one Albany. day trip to one Albany. Day trip there and back to Albany. Is anybody going? I am. I'm going. I'm, You're going. I may try. I'm going to see I think I I'm going. I can get my schedule, going? but I'm not sure yet. Mm -hmm. Carm, you going? All right, we'll move on to information sharing. Ray uh, Giamartino from the City School District spoke on transforming a school culture. Uh, he talked about the management systems and the topic of APPR came to the forefront and the discussion kind of morphed into whether the schools are a social agency rather than an academic place of learning. And um, the, I guess you'd call it the white elephant in the room, was uh, the social changes that are affecting school and that are getting in the way of academics. Uh, I also this week attended a uh, workshop that um, I sent you an email about a couple of weeks ago, an initiative started by the Penfield Schools offering online elective courses in their high school. Um, they would like to form a consortium with other Monroe County schools uh, working collectively with the hope of offering more electives. And it would be a pilot program. They're using Moodle as their basic online platform. Uh, participants would have to select two courses and teachers to propose for this pilot year. Uh, a leadership team is probably going to be formed within each district whose purpose would be to coordinate and direct the consortium. I would strongly suggest that if Webster uh, chooses to participate in this, that we have some board participation, participation because there are some policy and negotiation and uh, financial considerations that uh, need to be addressed. So that's the report from information. And on the executive committee, they did meet last week. Uh, they approved their goals and missions, and for those that would like to know, they're trying to focus on creating a packet of information that will help guide uh, members if they'd like to transition from uh, as officers of the association. They also are taking on, um, well, they're taking some of the section of the uh, Monroe County School Board's uh, website, and they're going to focus on providing more information about the strength of local public schools. And they're also creating some talking points designed to help the public uh, understand the complex educational issues. And we also approved a draft in response to Governor Cuomo's statement about underperforming schools. We, um, well, to summarize this, uh, the paper states that if the state is serious about improving students' results, it must acknowledge and act on its moral and constitutional obligations. And although the governor continually criticizes the high cost of public schools, he has to start doing something about mandate relief. And that's what the, the paper said. And that was a report from the executive committee. Tom, anything on the um, president's report? Oh, thank you very much uh, for mentioning Adele and this convention is coming up. Um, it's ahead of last year's attendance. So they're expecting almost 2,000 board members, um, plus other guests, administrators, and vendors it should be huge. Uh, there is something, I think, if you keep your ear to the ground, you're going to hear something from Michael Rebell coming out uh, while going after the state again for proper funding of education at all levels. It's something that he was looking for, the support of various organizations and we all had to kind of pull back because it was kind of dropped in there was a universal pre-k becoming mandatory in five years including after five years full day pre-k to the age of three wow. we haven't even mandated that school starts at the age of five yet mm -hmm. that was my pushback from NISBA along with the executive committee that if you're going to start doing that the state legislature has to step up and officially say school starts at a certain age mm -hmm. because pre-k even in some situations, full day K required a lot of districts to go through some expensive building and renovations to be able to house just kindergarten. If you now do a pre-K situation, uh, again, it could be extremely expensive for the state. 
and we're looking them to fund the traditional K-12 education the way they should be, at the level they should be, before we start going somewhere else. So right now, NISCUS has not, NISBA has not endorsed. NICE, we're not sure where they will be, uh, mm -hmm. but they haven't stepped out yet. Currently, right now, the only organizations that are, and, and not that it's not a laudable goal, it is a laudable goal, but we asked him to be more precise in where that would be best used. Don't paint the state with a roller, go in with a fine brush. If it needs to be in certain areas, especially low poverty areas, to help out, put it in there, but don't make it a state mandate. Because it's what it would be after two years of funding, it would become an unfunded mandate. Yeah. That's my report. Thank you, Tom. Janine, anything on audit? Uh, Mike and Adele and I received a copy of the audit from Ray Wager's office for preliminary review, and it will come to the board at the next meeting. And that's it. Thank you. We did policies, Sue, but do you have anything else to say on it? Just that, you know, we're up and running. Uh, we're reviewing the student achievement and well-being policies this year, and our next meeting is December 10th. Thank you. Board, you've had the opportunity to look at the consent agenda, which includes minutes from our regular meetings, personnel actions, the recommendation on the Committee on Special Education, a recommendation on the Committee on Preschool Education, uh, use of facilities, and the local assistance plan. May we have a motion to accept the consent agenda? So moved. Second, please. Thank you, Janine. All in favor of the consent agenda? Aye. Motion carries. Before we ask for a motion to adjourn, I'm just going to point out to the board our next meeting is November 7th, and the convention is next week. Hope to see people there. May we have a motion to adjourn, please? So moved. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Good night, everyone.